Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ellen Wilson, and I'll be the moderator for this expert briefing for the media, which is hosted by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. This briefing will feature leading experts who will examine the current state of COVID-19 vaccinations, both in the US and globally, as well as hurdles that remain for achieving high coverage and herd immunity. They will provide an overview on what has and has not worked in the vaccine rollout in the US and globally, and address whether additional boosters will be needed in the coming year to continue to provide protection against COVID-19. Please note that participants are welcome to use images, video, or quotes directly from the briefing, and that the content is for immediate release. First, I'd like to briefly introduce our two speakers. Dr. Anna Durbin is trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases and studies experimental vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, dengue, West Nile, Zika, malaria, and more in human clinical trials and in controlled human infection studies. She is currently the site PI at Johns Hopkins for the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Other trials have included vaccines against HIV, hepatitis C, HPV, influenza, rotavirus, respiratory sin seashell virus, dengue, and malaria. Dr. Nayor Barzev is a pediatric infectious disease physician and statistical epidemiologist who studies how to maximize vaccine benefits for low resource, high mortality areas of the world. He has over 20 years of experience in global child health across East Asia, the Pacific, and Africa. He has expertise in clinical medicine, tropical child health, epidemiology of infectious diseases, statistical methods, and clinical trials. We will have time for questions following our panelists' remarks, and the procedure will be as follows. We will take some questions that have been submitted in advance of the briefing and some from the Zoom chat. If you have a question during the briefing, you can enter it in the Zoom chat addressed to all panelists. Please enter your name, media outlet, and question. We hope to cover as many as possible. Just a note that participants will be muted during this briefing and it will be recorded. Dr. Durbin, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And it's really my pleasure to be here. I was just thinking on where we were a year ago, one month after WHO declared the pandemic. We didn't know if we were going to be able to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, how long it would take. We didn't know if it would even work. And now we have three vaccines licensed under emergency use authorization here in the US with a fourth that's applying for EUA in the upcoming weeks. It's extraordinary. We have 40% of Americans who have received at least one dose of vaccine and 26% who are fully vaccinated. And just today, President Biden has announced that he has more than reached his COVID immunization goal. We have 200 million vaccinated already, well ahead of schedule. So how did we get here? Well, the unprecedented speed with which three COVID-19 vaccines were licensed in the US was really due to an enormous cooperative effort between the US government, pharmaceutical companies, clinical trial networks funded by the NIH and regulatory authorities. Typically vaccines are evaluated in three sequential phases with each phase taking years. In the case of COVID-19 vaccine development, these phases were overlapped and conducted simultaneously. And we could do this because the government removed the financial risk to the manufacturers by guaranteeing the purchase of millions of doses, whether a vaccine worked or not. And I do want to stress that although the timeline of vaccine evaluation was compressed, the safety evaluations of these vaccines was not compromised. Safety with vaccines always comes first. It's been no different with these COVID-19 vaccines. Each of the efficacy trials enrolled at least 30,000 volunteers and they will be followed for the two year duration of the study. However, it's important to note that clinical trials cannot detect very rare adverse events that may occur. And so safety surveillance does not end with licensure or EUA. The US has systems in place after vaccine licensure to detect adverse events, even if they're very rare and with low frequency. And we already have seen two examples of this. 
One was the recognition of anaphylaxis after the rollout of the mRNA vaccines. We recognize that about one in every 250,000 vaccinations with Pfizer can have an allergic, severe allergic reaction, and one out of 350,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine. We also recognized a very rare event called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST, in recipients of the J&J &J vaccine, and in Europe, recipients of the AstraZeneca vaccine. There have been eight cases of CVST in recipients of the J&J &J vaccine with more than 7 million doses administered in the US, so very, very rare. And it's important to note that this signal was identified through surveillance in vaccinations and the vaccinations were paused within six weeks of vaccine rollout. So the signal was identified early and is now being examined. The identification of these CVST cases is because the vaccine safety surveillance systems that we currently have in place are working. And this should provide confidence that vaccine safety systems do not stop with the authorization or licensure of a vaccine. They continue for as long as those vaccines are being used. I also just wanna comment that although the vaccine development timeline was compressed for COVID-19 vaccines, I don't see this as becoming sort of the new normal for vaccine development. The platforms that we're currently using are very exciting and will be continued to use in the future for new vaccines, but the timeline to licensure will not be as short. The vaccine manufacturers will bear most of the financial risk for the development of vaccines outside of this pandemic and will not be making the enormous investment required without some insurance from early trials that the vaccines would work. And lastly, I wanna comment that although we've made great progress with COVID-19 vaccines, we still have work to do. All of these vaccines have extremely high efficacy against severe and hospitalized COVID, as well as against death caused by COVID. And these are the critical efficacy endpoints that will make a public health impact and get us out of this pandemic. The vaccines are providing us light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to ensure global vaccine access because we will not be entirely out of the pandemic until the world is vaccinated. And I think with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Durbin. Now we will hear from Dr. Barzev. Dr. Barzev, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for having me and everybody who's participating. Uh, look, uh, we've heard um, about the success of science really here in this past year of bringing us to where we are. But the challenge now that remains is really a, a human challenge. Um, it's a massive undertaking to roll out vaccines at a global level and the logistical and the social uh, uh, barriers to achieving that are really substantial. Um, we have made major gains in the United States over the last few months, but still there are issues of access for older adults and challenges for older adults in, in reaching vaccine. And also we're, we're still learning about disparities among communities of color and other groups within the United States where vaccine uptake is lower than in other groups. So these require grassroots interventions and community-based interventions to really address, and that's happening and, and with much success, but there's still work to be done. Uh, on a global level, uh, although the vast majority of countries around the world have formally introduced COVID vaccines, I think the number that haven't is about nine, uh, nevertheless, the number of doses are given is hugely variable. And there are many parts of the world that haven't had yet realistic access to vaccines in arms and people, you know, people themselves going and receiving the vaccine. And there are a number of reasons for that. And it's not for lack of effort. There's been right from the outset of this pandemic, there's been a major collaborative effort by the scientific community, by the public health community, by the political community to ensure that vaccines are made available globally. But the realities on the ground are, are difficult. We have issues of supply, of having enough doses and ramping up enough doses. Uh, we have issues of domestic needs so that major manufacturers are producing for their own populations, which is a, an understandable prioritization. Uh, there have been issues around vaccine uh, confidence uh, and made worse by uh, recent uh, questions around uh, safety, even though uh, the signals are very reassuring as we've heard. Um, and countries need to be prepared not only to receive the vaccine, but to deploy it. So we have to train enough staff and have the logistics for transport and so on. So these are uh, big challenges that we're currently in and facing. And why does it matter? Why does it matter to us, let's say in the US, that, that people in Ghana are well vaccinated or that people in Burkina Faso are well vaccinated or in Indonesia? 
So I think it's important to understand that a pandemic, by definition, is a global phenomenon. And so the response has to be global as well. We, as we heard Professor Devon says, we can get out of it once everybody's out of it. And largely this relates to ongoing transmission and the impact that that would have on the emergence of variants of concern. A variant is a form of the virus that can evade immune response in some cases. Perhaps it could be more transmissible. Perhaps it can cause more severe disease, depending on the variant. But the best way to reduce the, the emergence of variants and their dominance across the world is to reduce transmission of the virus in populations everywhere. And that can be achieved through high coverage with the existing vaccine. It can be achieved through maximizing the breadth of vaccine products that are available, maximizing their production and maximizing their delivery around the world. And if we can do that and ensure that everybody has access to a good COVID vaccine, the licensed or at least an approved emergency approved COVID vaccine, doesn't have to be the 95% efficacious one. It could be an 80% efficacious one. It's still going to do uh, good for the individual recipient and even more good for the global community. So I'd strongly encourage uh, our, our investment in, in those undertakings at a global level and, and to position the United States as a leader uh, in, in global vaccine access. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barzev. Now we will take questions. And just a reminder, if you have a question, please enter it in the Zoom chat with your name, media outlet question, and to whom you'd like to address your question. The first question is from Lindsay Tanner at the Associated Press for both Dr. Durbin and Dr. Barzev. What is the most likely explanation for the surge in Michigan? So I can, I'll start with that. I think it's really twofold. One, we do get confidence with vaccination and seeing vaccinations rolled out. I think people relaxed a little bit. They're doing more without their masks, without social distancing. And then we've also seen reports in the news that the B117 variant is circulating in Michigan. And we do know that that's more transmissible. So I really think it's twofold. Yeah, no, I'll just second that. I think, you know, vaccines are enormously powerful tools in public health but they're not our only tool and we need to maximize every tool we have at our disposal. And that does include masks and it includes distancing and it includes uh, public restrictions where, where, where appropriate uh, and certainly to ramp up vaccine access to all communities that need it. Once we do all of that, we will start to see a turnaround and then they'll allow for a relaxation of some of these other measures that have been so impactful. Great, thank you both. Here are several questions from Matt Gregory at WUSA Channel 9 and out of Washington, D.C. For both of you, what do we know so far about the boosters to the vaccines? Are all the companies testing them and how long will that testing take? If you received a one-shot vaccine, should you get the booster from the others? And we can start with you, Dr. Durbin. So yes, most of the companies are in fact developing and testing uh, booster shots uh, of their vaccine. And importantly, I think to note is that this booster will likely cover the most uh, extreme variant that we know of the South African variant. So it may be a little bit different than the vaccine that you're currently getting, which I think is good news. Uh, the other good news is those are starting to be tested and even different platforms or mixed vaccinations are also starting to be tested, particularly in the UK. So we should have some data, some information about, for instance, an mRNA vaccine, followed by an adenovirus vectored vaccine and vice versa. Dr. Barzev? Yeah, look, it's very normal that um, we have booster doses of vaccines. This, uh, the expectation that the vaccine is once and you're protected for life is, is unusual with vaccines. It's very common that vaccines require repeat dosing or boosting. We have a tetanus shot every 10 years. Mm -hmm. Older adults have a pneumococcal vaccine every five years. So even just for the fact that the of potential for waning protection from any vaccine, that, you know, raises a, a requirement for boosting, and all the more so in the current context with the variants emerging, uh, we will have an opportunity to reboost, to revaccinate, and to broaden our protection, not only make it more long-lasting. So I think it's a positive development. Mm -hmm. Great. And for you, Dr. Barzev, what do we know about Israel's COVID treatment drug XOCD24? What is it supposed to do? Who is it to be used for? What have early studies shown? Uh, look, it's an early stage. Uh, uh, it's in early stage trials. Uh, the, the concept here is that we're using an immune modulator mm -hmm. to dampen down uh, some of the T cells that are, uh, that are responsible for the cytokine storm that we sometimes see in severe disease. So this is a product that's designed to deal with moderate to severe disease in COVID. It would be wonderful if it works. 
but it's in early stage trials. There are many, many products out there that go through early stage trials. They look very promising. They look good on paper. They uh, carry potential, but they don't make it through the pipeline of, of rigorous testing. So I think it's too early to say anything certain about it, but it's encouraging that we have a, a product that potentially can reduce disease severity, and that is going to be making its way through rigorous trials and evaluation. Great. And here are several questions from Elena Debray at Slate for Dr. Durbin. <clears throat> Why do different people have different physical reactions to the vaccine? Why do some random body pains like shooting pain in the arm, et cetera, occur? And why does pain in the arm occur in general after the vaccine? Boy, what an interesting question. Yeah, the, the easy answer to that is that everybody is different. So we have different immune responses. We have different pain tolerances. We have different reactions to different things. Some people are allergic to bee stings. Some people aren't. And it's the same with vaccine reactogenicity. We do know that, that different people react differently. We do see, seem to see more reactogenicity in women and that's felt to be due to their immune response. Um, but I think you know what's important to note is that the severity of your reactogenicity is not indicative, for instance, of how well you're going to respond to a vaccine. So if you didn't have a lot of side effects from the vaccine, that doesn't mean you didn't respond to the vaccine. The vaccine likely worked just fine. And one of the reasons we have specifically arm pain with vaccines is because we're giving these vaccines in an amount of liquid into areas where you have muscles. So there's not a lot of space for that liquid to go. And as you stretch those muscle fibers that you're injecting the vaccine into, that can be painful and it can take a while for that to go down, much like a bruise in your, in your, uh, in your muscle is how I would describe it. Thank you so much. And here's a question from Karen Weintraub at USA Today for Dr. Barzev. What do you think the ACIP will should do on Friday in terms of resuming use of the J&J &J vaccine? Um, well, I wouldn't want to step into their shoes. I think they're <laughs> facing some challenging times. But look, overall, what we know is that um, the blood clot situation that we've seen both for AstraZeneca vaccines in, in the UK, in Germany, and now also in the US for Johnson & Johnson, you know, these are rare events, uh, rare in, you know, in the order of one in a million. Uh, and you know, more rare than, than the number of humans that are struck by lightning every year in the United States. Um, but they are significant and they carry significant outcomes for the people in whom they occur. We also know that COVID disease itself can cause these kinds of clots at a rate which is an, close to an order of magnitude higher than, uh, than from the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So a decision really needs to be made about the appropriateness of ongoing use of vaccination. I think it's clear that the benefits of vaccination still outweigh the risks, mm -hmm. but the population, the community needs to be informed of what those risks are so that they can make informed decisions and informed choice. It behooves us to be very thorough about our evaluation of the degree of risk, the extensiveness of the risk, and also in understanding particular groups in whom the risk perhaps would be higher than in others in whom we might make particular recommendations. Everybody needs to be aware of the order of magnitude of this risk. Uh, and it, it's possible that the ACIP or the FDA or others might suggest that, that vaccination be used more so in low risk groups. We, we have this situation where we have people who are at high risk of disease, the, the old, older adults at high risk of disease are themselves at lower risk of these side effects. So it makes sense to continue these vaccinations in those groups. But even in younger people, the benefits still are very likely to outweigh the risks. I am not privy to every single case of these events. That's what the FDA is there for. That's why we have rigorous regulatory mechanisms in this country. And we'll be able to come up with a policy that is informative and uh, balances those risks and benefits correctly uh, to different population groups. Great, thank you so much. And um, a couple of questions for you, Dr. Durbin. Mm -hmm. um, on boosters again, Valerie De Benedet of Very Well Health, what is a booster designed to do? Extend the protection of the original vaccine or protect against a variant? And can vaccines against several variants be combined into one shot? And any idea of when the boosters will start to be administered? And Dr. Barzev, if you want to comment as well, but we'll start with Dr. Durbin. Well, that's a really great question. And I think the name says it all, boosters. So what does that mean? It means we're trying to boost your immune response. What happens over time is you're vaccinated and then the antibodies in your blood system, although they go up very high after vaccination, 
they come back down. Your body doesn't continually produce them in the absence of what I'll call a stimulus. So they come down to what we call a baseline level. And when you get that booster dose, what happens is your body says, hey, I've seen this before. I know I'm supposed to react to this and then produces a heightened immune response again, which takes you up to that higher level. So it can just increase, for instance, the amount of antibodies that you have in your blood when you get those booster doses. And the companies are, are planning um, you know, different types of what I'll call second generation vaccines as opposed to just booster vaccines because the, their purpose is really twofold. Um, one, we don't know when we're going to need boosters. And I'm going to go back to what we've sort of said earlier in the program is a lot of that will absolutely depend on control of the pandemic worldwide. As long as we have virus circulating across the globe, we're going to see more variants arise and it's going to increase the likelihood that we'll need an additional booster too. Um, those, those second generation vaccines are now being designed to produce an immune response specifically in most cases against the South African variant. And I think what's very exciting in studies that have been done in research in people who were infected with the original strain and then infected with the South African strain or vaccinated with the original vaccine and then infected with the South African strain, we've seen a broadening of the immune response to cover many different variants, including SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS virus. So I think that's very, very exciting. Um, I imagine that that the licensure process of this second generation or booster dose will not need to require as many volunteers, of course, as original licensure. So they should be able to be made and will probably, if I had to guess, would be um, available late um, 2021, early 2022. Great. Dr. Borisov, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, those are very extensive comments. Uh, you've covered a lot. But I, I would just say that I think it's important to remember that we don't yet have a correlate of protection. We don't know mm -hmm. which antibody level is required to produce protection. And it may not only hinge only on antibodies. We know the importance of T-cell responses. Uh, the vaccines produce a broad uh, uh, T-cell response, and that may itself provide uh, widespread protection against emerging variants also. The other exciting thing is that we're seeing that even if the vaccines themselves may not fully protect to the same degree against, uh, against variants at an individual level, if they're widely deployed and used at population level, that produces enough population level protection to suppress the emergence of variants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we don't have to have a perfect vaccine. We have to have a good vaccine, but we have to use it widely and we have to use it universally, ideally. Uh, and that really will help us in the battle against these variants. Um, so boosters are likely, again, it's normal to have multivalent vaccines for other conditions. We do have many vaccines that are addressing more than one variant of, of an organism, and that may very well be done here. Uh, another area with the second generation vaccines is also looking at thermostability. One of the challenges mm -hmm. with the mRNA yes. vaccines has been you know, the ultra cold cold chain that's required, and that limits their utility in many places around the world. If I'm going through um, mountaintops in Papua New Guinea or through island atolls in in a Pacific nations, it's difficult to do that with an ultra cold fridge of minus 70 degrees centigrade. But you know, if we can get an mRNA vaccine that's you know, safe, well tolerated, efficacious, and able to be in a small fridge or a cool box on my back, that would be fantastic. And that, that also a lot of work being done uh, to produce those vaccines. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so here is another question for you, Dr. Barzev from Bloomberg News. How should we think about the U.S. responsibility to vaccinate the world in the context of where the U.S. rollout and supply is right now? Um, it's a great question, and it brings together both um, you know, scientific aspects, but also political aspects. And mm -hmm. I, I'll probably limit my remarks more to the scientific ones. But you know, <laughs> there, there is a role of, that the U.S. carries in terms of uh, you know, the scientific endeavor, in terms of conducting trials at a very, uh, not only rigorously, but also very uh, broadly. We have much more inclusive trials here than, than anywhere else. We have uh, leadership in research capacity and in public health policy and in many other aspects that are relevant here. Also many of the global funders and supporters are based here. So clearly we have, um, we have an opportunity to really uh, improve global health through the leadership that we have here in the United States. The word responsibility is an important word, but everybody carries responsibility uh, and not only the United States and national governments 
want to take on that responsibility for vaccinating their populations. It's not the case that uh, countries in low income settings are sitting, sit, are sitting around waiting for, for us to you know, be kind enough to give them a vaccine. It's a question of justice, a question of distribution. People want access to the vaccine so that they can take responsibility for vaccinating their populations. But we can help with the know-how and we can help with the, with the, with the planning and we can help. We lost him for one second. Uh, I may turn to you, Dr. Durbin, for on several questions from Aaron Ritchie of KSDK in Missouri. How common are breakthrough cases and who is most likely to experience a breakthrough case? And can it be prevented? And does suffering from a breakthrough case affect someone's susceptibility to COVID-19 variants? So that's, that's a great question. We do see um, breakthrough cases with all vaccines. No vaccine will 100% um, prevent infection. And I think that is what is really a key point to bring out. Um, we are not expecting these vaccines to completely prevent infection. We, these vaccines are designed to prevent disease. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the prevention of hospitalization, severe COVID. Most of the breakthrough cases that we have seen have been milder than, um, than regular COVID, although there have been severe cases, certainly in hospitalized cases. Most of the breakthrough cases that we see tend to occur either before the vaccination series has been completed or shortly after. We know that that's sort of before um, your immune system has really um, been primed up and is working. Other cases where we may expect to see breakthrough cases are when the, we don't get a good vaccine take. And we know that that can happen, for instance, with um, patients who are on significant immunosuppressive therapies. So for instance, we know those people who have had kidney transplants, liver transplants, and are on um, significant immunosuppressive therapy don't respond well to the vaccine. They don't make good antibody responses. And we think that certainly, um, it is a risk that they may have breakthrough cases because they're just not getting a good vaccine take. There's no indication that if you have a breakthrough case, you're more likely um, to have another infection with the variant. What I will say and what we saw from studies in South Africa is certainly um, people who were vaccinated may have had infections with uh, the South African variant. So you may have been vaccinated and get infected or have a breakthrough case with a variant. But what's really important to note is that the vaccine, and, and in this case, it was the J&J &J vaccine, although there it was less efficacious, it had lower efficacy against the South African variant overall, it was 100% effective in the prevention of death due to the South African variant, and it was 85% effective at preventing severe hospitalized uh, COVID due to the South African variant. So even though we may see some breakthrough infections with the variant and, and to, um, uh, to Dr. Barzi's point with other parts of the immune system like T cell immunity, we think that that can control the infection. And so we're not going to see the severity of disease with these breakthrough cases in people who have already been vaccinated. Great, okay, and here is a last question for you, Dr. Durbin. This is from Julie Steen Hewson at Reuters. What advice do you have for people who are taking drugs, you had mentioned earlier, to treat autoimmune diseases such as steroids or Humira? Can they mount an immune response and do they need to continue masking, distancing post-vaccination? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what we know is that people who are taking and it will depend somewhat on the autoimmune medication that you're taking, but certainly those B-cell um, monoclonal antibodies like Humira and, and other autoimmune disease do affect your antibody response. And so it's recommended that you try to hold some of those immunosuppressive agents um, around two weeks before getting vaccinated to try to improve your immune response. Um, you know, we're recommending that everybody who's vaccinated Still, when they're out in public, when they're around people that they, you know, that haven't been vaccinated or they, they're in public spaces to certainly continue to mask and to social distance. And I would certainly say that um, for people who are taking immunosuppressive medication and um, are vaccinated. We're currently doing clinical trials now to try to understand how we can boost the immune response uh, to vaccines in people who are taking immunosuppressive 
uh, suppressive therapy or who are immunocompromised. So hopefully those clinical trials will help us not only understand it, but improve the immune response in people taking those medications. Great, thank you. Just one really quick one. We have just one minute left. And this is Abby Isaacs at WMAR Baltimore. Can you address the FDA's latest report about concerning conditions at emergent biosolutions? <laughs> Well, you know, I've read those reports and certainly, you know, that is concerning. And I think what we have to understand is that, um, you know, the FDA does inspect vaccine manufacturers and have very stringent um, requirements around manufacture. And I think what's important to note is that they caught uh, deficiencies and uh, had the J&J &J vaccine that was made there destroyed or not used. So, you know, I think what that's going to show is that uh, Emergent has some work to do to clean up their processes. They will likely um, need to be reinspected by the FDA before any vaccine that's produced there would be accepted. And I think that's good. Again, I would say that this is another example that we do have, um, we do have regulations and we do have processes in place that ensure that the vaccines that are produced are high quality, that they are safe, and that they will be effective in the prevention of COVID. Great, thank you so much, very encouraging. Thank you for your presentation and for to thank you to Dr. Barza for his presentation um, and insightful answers to the questions. We will email the links to the resources mentioned today and shared in the chat to all the participants. With that, I'd like to say thank you again to everyone for joining us today. You're welcome.